Hi friends, are you considering a lucrative career and working in a brothel? Well, neither am I, but if you are considering such a new juncture in your career, you will certainly enjoy today's guest, Alison Schrager, an economist and author of a book called An Economist Walks Into a Brothel and Other Unexpected Places to Understand Risk. And of course, the subtitle is what was so fascinating to me. We talked about many, many different things, including the economics and risk reduction mechanisms, not only for brothels, uh, admittedly a little bit less applicable to the erudite listeners of this very podcast, but also risk reduction in things like life insurance, even getting married, having children. We talked about all these topics, as well as her experiences with professional poker players, big wave surfers, Nobel Prize winning economists, and other fascinating characters that make up the many examples in very clear and easy to understand prose uh, in this book. It's really an unexpected little treat that I happened to find out from a well-known scientist, Robert Kiyosaki, otherwise known as Rich Dad slash Poor Dad. I don't know. Uh, but that's uh, where I heard about Allison. I listened to his podcast. And uh, sometimes it's pretty interesting to find very, very interesting intellectuals such as Allison Schrager. So that was an unexpected place to find her, and I am delighted that I did. So stay tuned today. You'll find out uh, kind of the answers to many questions that we take for granted uh, in a given day, such as how early should you leave to get to the airport for your next flight? How you could handle the risks of dealing with COVID versus you know responding to a text message as you're driving your car? And other very interesting risk tidbits backed by good hard science and really explained in a clear and convincing way. You'll hear about Allison's upcoming book, which is also about risk and including risk in love. And we just talked about so much stuff today. I know you're going to enjoy it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Pandemic Podcasting um, Into the Impossible with yours truly, Brian Keating. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this episode of Into the Impossible. And today we have on a change of pace, a spectacular guest who's written a phenomenal book that I found out from none other than uh, everyone's favorite economist and financial advisor, Robert Kiyosaki. Yes, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is where I first discovered Allison. Allison is the author of the book, An Economist Walks Into a Broad. Uh, and other amazing stories about how human beings can best manage that all elusive yet all important factor of life, which is risk and the management thereof. And she offers a great deal of tactics and tricks and strategies for us to deal with risk in our lives, whether we be big wave surfers, whether we be uh, stock market aficionados, uh, or whether we happen to work in a brothel, which I've stopped doing, but but nevertheless, is uh, is one of the major topics of the book. So, Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and I'm sorry it took so long to get you on the podcast, but I've been mm -hmm. fascinated with your book and your work for a long time. Thanks for joining us so much in the Into the Impossible podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So, uh, your book has a provocative title, and I wonder if you'd be willing to do the following, which is to uh, explain to us first how you came up with the title and the cover for An Economist Walks Into a Brothel, uh, and after that, uh, we'll play a game of risk management where we look at the various reviews uh, that have been garnered for this fantastic book, and we'll examine the dispersion, the the standard deviation of those, <laughs> of those <laughs> reviews, if you're willing to do so but first tell sure. us how did you come up with the name of the book the title of the book and what it's uh and what the uh, subtitle is all about well um i i'm terrible at titles i did come up with the title but not as the book title mm. uh when i sat down to write it you know I, I wrote down an economist walks into a brothel because for me this was an unusual journey i'm trained as an economist later as a financial economist so what we do generally is we sit at our desks and look at data actually going into the world and talking to people is generally not what economists do we're not trained to we're not encouraged we've got terrible social skills it's not something we do so um when i was making these trips to the Nevada brothels, like it was just weird for a lot of reasons. One, it was a brothel. It wasn't sort of the environment I'd ever been to. But two, it was just really 
testing my research ability. I said I wasn't trained. It's not like I'm an anthropologist or a sociologist, and I've been trained to talk to people. So actually, like lo- studying an economic subject up close was for me just stepping into this other world. So. I said, I'm not normally a good title person. When I was sitting down to write that first chapter, I kind of just wrote it as a, as a t- chapter head just because it represented to me, m- me crossing that line. Hmm. And then I didn't think much of it. I'd even forgotten it was a chapter head. I sort of w- wrote the book. And then the publisher actually picks your title. And they picked a title I didn't love. I felt like it was kind of boring. I don't remember what it was. That so tell- tells you how boring it was. <laughs> and... Um, we kept fighting. I'm like, I feel like there's a sexier title out there. And I kept throwing out ideas and they all caught, explained to me why they were so terrible. So then they came back to me a couple weeks later after we agreed on the bad title. And they were like, we think you're right. We should go with something sexier. We realize it's in front of us the whole time. We're going to go with The Economist Walks Into a Brothel. Which I said, I even forgot was a title because they said it was so personal to me. And I was like, I, I instantly heard it. I'm like, yes, that's it. And the cover, I don't know if that's a lot less of a sexy story. Again, you um, are presented a lot of, first, we had all these pictures, like, mm. you know, art. Like, I, I, my, the books with portfolio has amazing p- artists. And they had all these, like, pictures of, like, women doing risque things. And we we're so sort of like, eh, I don't know if this is the right message. This is really an economics book, a financial economics book. So, um we discussed that. Then they had a meeting. They have a lot of meetings with the publisher, and they said we had a meeting, and we've decided you're right. We're just going to go with words. And then there was a lot of boring conversations. I won't, I won't torture you with about obsessing about colors. <laughs> well, it is a delightful, if not sparse, cover. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, what I've been doing lately is exploring the phase space of riskiness uh, with regard to authors who do come on the podcast. And I ask them if they're willing to go truly into the impossible and and confront and respond to the highest verified review on Amazon and the lowest verified review on Amazon. It's kind of fun. Uh, uh, but if you are willing, we can do it. If not, and I only use verified reviews because they have skin in the game, as you talk about. So I will not accept a review by somebody, good or bad, who hasn't bought the book. Um, sure. I, I, I tend not to read negative reviews, but, uh, yeah. Okay. I don't, I, yeah, I'm, I'm open to hearing it, I guess. This is uh, someone titled Alison Schrager's Mother. Um, the best book ever written. No, no, this is uh, someone named Robert says, The cleverest application of economics I know. The title doesn't, if the title doesn't induce you to buy this book, then the first few, few pages will do it. Alison Schrager has done a masterful job explaining in plain English, using rather ahem, unconventional examples and illustrations of how to take account and manage risk in your life, drawing on fundamental lessons on, on finance and economics. Do you care to rebut those accusations of this five-star re- verified review? No, no, it's lovely. <laughs> uh, Robert, I, I, I actually don't even know Robert, but that's a very kind uh, thing to say. His last name is Merton. I don't know if you... Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just yeah. kidding. He did write you a review on the back of the book. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, here's a negative review. I almost never write a book uh, that's ne- book review that's negative. I heard her on the show talking about some aspect of politics as an example of exercise and risk management. It was an unusual exp- approach, expressed cogently and interestingly, so I thought, I bet her book is great. Nope. Once you get past the title, the book's ideas are not that well developed. She doesn't go deep enough into any of them. And, but then he says, I only made it through half the book before giving up. So mm-hmm. I disagree with this person. You don't have to disagree with them. But uh, I found that the book is, is like a tidal wave of unassailable knowledge and, and wisdom from disparate fields. So well, I, I know what I would advise this person, but what would you advise them? Uh, well, I mean, you're not going to connect with everyone. Um, for yeah. me, the book I, I found the ideas of financial economics incredibly powerful and mm-hmm. poorly understood. I think so. I was really inspired to write this book so people could understand these principles better because I think they 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 seem so subtle, but they're actually quite important. I think uh, certainly as I've been observing a lot of the conversation around things like GameStop and day trading, how these principles of risk really sound so simple, but they're really poorly understood. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, my, my idea for this book was to take these principles and make them sound easy. I remember the publisher, when I explained the principles, he's like, you make hard things sound easy. Mm. And sometimes people think because you make something sound easy, it is. 
And so maybe it just wasn't the right format for this particular reader. Yeah. Um, I mean, to some degree, I feel like if someone said didn't finish your book, that's on you. I mean, it's on me, the author, because I mean, it's it's I'm, my background in journalism makes me feel like I failed somehow if someone doesn't keep reading. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't blame him for not finishing. But maybe, as I said, it wasn't the right format for him to learn. Or as I said, a lot of the net more negative feedback I got from people was that it all sounded so obvious. But sometimes making something hard sound simple, I think, is an interesting challenge. And I think a lot harder than making something complicated easy sound complicated. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly there's a, uh, a ton of, uh, you know, red meat, as they say, or if you're vegan, you know, red tofu, uh, for people that want to sink their teeth into aspects that are quantitative, you give a thorough explanation of all the Greek symbols and the Black-Scholes equation, and, and you do so in a in a comprehensive manner, but it's, it's entertaining, and with examples ranging from, you know, how early or late uh, a route should you take to get to the airport, for example, mm -hmm. which is one of the places I want to start. So... I want to get your opinion on a couple of um, canards or things that I've heard in my career, and then we'll get into risk management. We'll, we'll touch upon GameStop and the stock market and Bitcoin, and then we'll talk about uh, risk management and other aspects of life, ranging from family formation to other things. We'll stay away from the brothel. We're not going to go there, except to say that I believe it's true that the Mustang Bunny Ranch, another brothel, uh, was forfeited to the federal government uh, after convictions for tax fraud by the owners in the late 90s. Oh, really? Yeah, and then it was. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And then it was auctioned off, and the government took a receivership, and then it went out of business. <laughs> so, in other words, it was very successful. This is the apocryphal, perhaps, story. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out. So here's a here's a saying that one of my very well traveled, well healed friends tells me. He said to me, "If you're not missing one out of every ten flights that you go to take, you're wasting too much time in the airport." How, mm -hmm. how, do, you, how do you react to that uh, to that recommendation? Well, I definitely don't list that many flights. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think it depends on, you know, how important that trip is to you. Um, I mean, again, I, you know, I do talk about how much time do you need to get to the airport because, you know, you don't, you shouldn't spend two hours waiting for your flight. But I think uh, missing one out of 10 is also a little bit much too. Um, it depends how comfortable you are with missing or how good your relationship is with the airline. I think that's the question is how well insured are you? Because, if you don't have a good relationship with the airline, maybe you just don't go on your trip, and that's kind of awful, particularly if it's like a vacation, a family vacation. But, I mean, if you're, uh, you know, uh, have diamond status at your airline, they'll probably get you on another plane. So I think what's the right amount of flights to uh, miss probably depends on how well insured you are, which mm. probably depends on how much you've invested in your airline relationship. So, you know, considering whether or not there is uh, a single strategy to reduce risk uh, or not, in some cases, it seems like there is a clear and maybe there's only one strategy. I mean, there's a there's an old joke, not that funny, that goes something like this. You don't need a parachute to skydive. You just need a parachute if you want to go skydiving a second time. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we actually have, uh, you know, we, we don't need to actually test that scientifically in terms of physics of gravitational force fields. But uh, so there it's clear what the strategy for risk mitigation is. But uh, how does one go about choosing between the different types of strategies that you outline, uh, ranging from insurance to uh, optionality to, to hedging to, um, you know, kind of diminution of profit, et cetera? Um, what, what kind of, in, on, a, on a daily basis, is, you know, we're not confronted with whether, you know, going skydiving and not using a parachute, uh, but we, we are confronted with situations like car insurance or health insurance. Mm -hmm. I had on Patrick Bet-David, who's a famous uh, proprietor of a very popular YouTube channel, but also deals with insurance sales. And uh, and I said to him, you know, it's like insurance is unusual because the insurance company, you know, you're you're betting you're going to die and they're betting you're going to live <laughs> and, and, oh. and you're, you're taking all these various. But so. First, let's go back and say, what is the origin of the word risk itself? Where does it come from? Where does the concept of quantitative risk come from? Quantification um, risk. Well, there's a contentious question, but for, as far as I know, it's like, based on um, Peter Bernstein's book, It Means to Dare. I mean, and for a long time, it meant, I guess the original origins were, it was a Greek shipping term and it meant something dangerous. And still, when we talk about risk, risky, that usually means something bad. But later, I think around... Um, the Middle Ages or early Renaissance, uh, it, it changed this meeting, which was like this sort of Middle English to dare um, or German. I can't remember. 
it's been a while since I've done a book interview. <laughs> and uh, sorry. So, but it are our, 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 when around like so. Peter Bernstein's wonderful book is all about how, in a said late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, how risk became something that could be measured and controlled rather than just left to fate. And that's when the meaning also changed to include the upsides of risk. And this idea that you had some control over the risks you took really also changed its meaning to a lot of people. Although it is telling that usually when we say risky, we're referring to the bad things that could happen and not the good. Mm. So uh, one of the examples you give in the book, aside from the, you know, getting to the airport and your travel and your commute, uh, involves uh, essentially, you know, portfolio insurance and and other sorts of concepts that people have, have used for many years. And you point out that the originator of the theory behind how options should be priced, you know, uh, black scholes equation, that they later mm-hmm. went on to uh, become advisors to uh, to long term capital management, which it was you know perce- now it's funny you know we can we can think about uh, epochs in terms of how many financial crises ago was that <laughs> uh, uh-huh. so now this is like two or three ago mm-hmm. uh, in the early two thousands or late nineties when they basically it's funny now because the amount I believe of their uh, notional shortfall that the government bailed them out was like twenty billion dollars not not a small amount but but I think you know today even you know, GameStop or whatever uh, is is many many times that market cap. We'll talk about that. Uh, but I want to ask, you know, how is it that people that are so astute at you know judging risk, actually pricing risk, winning the Nobel Prize for risk uh, uh, quantification, how do they still fall victim to uh, sort of the most basic perils of risk management? Well, I mean, I think it's a complicated story. I mean, first of all, long-term capital management was never bailed out by the government. They were like kind of similar to um, get the GameStop hedge funds. Uh, they were bailed out by other hedge by other mm. uh, private players in the financial markets, which is, I think, an important difference when yeah. you don't have uh, tax terror money at stake. Um, And also, I mean, obviously, I think one reason why LTCM required, the government did organize the bailout. So, I mean, there's that. And the reason why that was necessary is there was uh, fixed income involved. And kind of like the financial crisis, uh, you know, you're more a lot more likely to have a financial crisis when debt's involved rather than equity. Like, that's why, you know, there are a lot of issues with GameStop, which we can discuss. But uh, sort of systemic risk isn't really something that worries me so much. I mean, I guess it's possible, but it's a lot harder to have systemic risk when you're uh, playing around with equities compared to debt. Um that said, you know, even if you're super smart, I mean, you can underestimate risk. We have these very powerful tools to reduce risk. Um, you know, I think behind LTCM, there, there's a lot of, you know, they, you know, according to um, the Lowenstein book, you know, the people in charge stopped listening to the smart people in the room and started taking on more and more risk because they wanted to get more and more money. But I think at the core, th- there were more fundamental issues, certainly around leverage. Whenever you take leverage, you're going to magnify your gains or your losses. And, you know, you can have this off distribution shock happen, like in that case, you know, with Russia. And, you know, all of a sudden your models don't work. And that, I think that's always a possibility. And that's why no matter how smart you are or how many smart people you're talking to, you have to always, as I said, be prepared to, for loss and for things that you don't anticipate. I think I, I like to think now after a year in which everyone sort of feels like they had an off distribution risk that, you know, we can all be more mindful of that. Yeah. So, yeah, famously a uh, great, uh, pr- you know, proprietor of all things analytic, ranging from the uh, conception of the law of universal gravitation to the laws of behind calculus, which is used, of course, in all sorts of financial and risk management uh, accounting practices. He said, this is Isaac Newton, who participated in the South Sea Bubble, which is a trading company, monopoly trading company that went uh, completely uh, belly up back in the 70s. Uh, 20s, he said, because uh, he fell victim to it, he said, I could calculate the motions of the heavenly stars, but not the madness of men. <laughs> and uh, I think it's pretty telling that, you know, the more that we uh, think that we have uh, a handle on the future based on some modeling that we have uh, reason to believe might be correct, but no data, obviously, because it's forward looking and future looking. And as the great philosopher of science, Yogi Berra said, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> and so we have no idea whether or not uh, our models will be borne out in practice. But I wanted to talk now about a personal issue uh, which involves the type of astronomy that I do which is in collaboration with colleagues literally on all seven continents and that's Mm -hmm. to build a new observatory 
In this case, the Simons Observatory, (laughs) named after Jim Simons, a hedge fund pioneer. You might have heard of him. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and there, of course, you know, I have a video with Jim Simons, and he explains the difference between alpha and beta and other Greek symbols that you talk about, too. But uh, but in this uh, campaign, what we're trying to do is build the world's most ambitious cosmic telescope located at an altitude of 17,200 feet in the north of Chile, the country of Chile in the southern hemisphere. So, you know, for five years now, we've been building this uh, instrument. We've had to build a construction plant. We've had to build a concrete mixing factory. Factory. We have to bring our own diesel fuel and generators and all sorts of things that have nothing to do with astronomy. But if you don't uh, account for them, you will not be able to construct the observatory. It runs on power and it sits on concrete. Uh, and around the world with vendors and suppliers, this is a $100 million project. And uh, we have so-called risk registers where we go over the likelihood of a given event, the consequences if it comes true, the uh, impact financially if it comes true, and mitigations if it comes true. So we had very extensive risk registers across Mm -hmm. the 10 major subsections of this new ambitious observatory. And we started this years ago, and not one, even though, you know, we're some of the smartest people in the world, my colleagues, at least not calling myself in their august company, but I get to play with them, so it's fun. Anyway, not one of our risks was COVID-19 pandemic will completely eliminate the possibility of travel to Chile, of of vendor supply disruptions, of graduate students quitting, of families being disrupted. Um, Why is it a valuable thing to look at risk with analytical continuous calculus and models when the most significant risks are these black swans, as as your uh, you know uh, c- field co-member uh, Taleb uh, calls these black swan events, seem to be much more dramatic in impact than something you can put a standard deviation attached to. So, what, what's your feeling about that? The difference between catastrophic or you know tail risks that really don't lend themselves to probability predictions. Well, I mean, they work 90% of the time, and that's not nothing, right? I mean, uh, you know, it's good to plan. I mean, I think my last chapter is about the risks you can't anticipate. And, you know, I spoke to H.R. McMaster because the military suffers with this, too. They want to plan everything. But nothing in battle goes down as you expect it will. But that doesn't mean it's not worth planning. I mean, first of all, you know, it it does work most of the time. Uh, I think the the, the trick is you've got to be humble about your plans. You've got to leave some room. You can't make your plans too rigid. You've got to leave an ability to pivot your plans. Because, I mean, there's also something to the process that prepares you for things like a pandemic that like you going through all these steps and thinking through of all these contingencies probably still left you better prepared than when the pandemic happened than if you just you know kind of winged it Mm. i mean because it does help you sort of again have things on the ground have more contacts uh all these sorts of things you probably you said research suppliers that you could get locally you know all these things it's very helpful then it helps you be better prepared because the thing is that you really need to prepare yourself for the black swan event is to go in well informed Mm. and you know you're not going to know everything in advance because the world is so unpredictable but the more informed you are for a sort of uncertain event the better off you're going to be So uh, famous uh, Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck uh, put together some insights in a a book called Mindset where she talks about these different objective, you know, kind of descriptions of the human mind, which basically she she claims cleave into one of two forms, you know, fixed versus growth mindset, uh, where one is, is really looking to quantify as much as possible to maybe perhaps appear smart and the belief is that say intelligence or even forecasting ability is fixed and the other one is kind of learning based curiosity based and wants to you know uh, lend itself to a tendency to learn which by necessity as you point out all good things require some risk and even some Mm -hmm. bad things war requires you know is a bad thing it's awful that we have to have war on occasion Uh, but uh, but you need to take risks in order to to succeed Um, so when when you you know have this assumption, are there people that believe that they're inherently good at uh, assessing risk, uh, and and do you believe that someone can be you know people say oh you're a mathematical genius because I'm a physicist I say that's not the case, but can someone be a risk genius? I think good risk geniuses know what they don't know. Mm-hmm. I think to that. And speaking of that, and they're comfortable with the limits of their knowledge. Um, 
you know, I, th- I think that's what sets apart good risk takers from bad risk takers. Um, as I said, it, it's like, I, I mean, I, I find it very seductive myself. Like, I like modeling risk. I, I have to admit this whole last year, which has posed so much uncertainty to everyone, I, I, I find risk modeling and staring at data gives me a lot of comfort because it helps me put numbers on things. Um, I, over the summer, I met up with some friends. I live in New York, so everything shut down. Yeah. Still, but we're allowed to eat outside. Anyway, there's blizzards going on. Yes, and exactly. People do this. How's it's that amazing. <laughs> it, it was amazing. I was walking outside. I went and met a friend for dinner last night. It was 25 degrees, and we had to wait. All the restaurants are, or the outdoor little structure, they have these little rickety structures built in the streets right now where everyone eats, and they're full. Mm. I mean, we're, we're a hearty people um, more than I would have expected. But, oh, yeah. So over the summer, I was having dinner with two friends. But it was summer, so it was actually a pleasant thing to eat outside. And my friends were like, you know, it's crazy we're doing this. We're really just playing Russian roulette with our lives. And I was like, "Mm, you know, I don't know about that. I mean, you (laughs) biked in city traffic to get here. I mean, that's something in a million years I would never, ever do. Um, But, like, I'm comfortable eating outdoors with friends during a pandemic. I mean, it's like, I feel like looking at the data, that seems a lot less risky to me. Yeah. So I think I I'm generally like have survived this being a lot less fearful because, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at data and that is my happy place. But also because I kind of went into this kind of also accepting that, you know, shit happens Mm -hmm. and things you can't predict and things you can't control. And you can take steps to minimize and mitigate your risk, but it's not going to ever go away. And I think that that knowledge has really made me, I don't know, serve me well. I don't know if anyone's handled this great, but like has has at least relieved me of anxiety that other people have. Mm. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned the COVID kind of differential risk management or willingness that people are are taking on. Uh, Oftentimes, my wife will text me, you know, as I'm driving the kids home from school, did you pick up the kids? And I'm like answering that question or she'll ask, she'll text me like, did you put hand sanitizer on their hands? And I'll say, you know, me answering that question is so much more dangerous as I'm driving than any risk of them contracting and and succumbing to some side effect of COVID. The other thing I see often on this campus at UC San Diego are, you know, students biking and tearing around on their skateboards. You know, we have the coolest students in the world and they're on their skateboards and they're on their phone and they've got their mask on and they don't wear a helmet and i'm like this is nuts like you know you're so much more you know prone to getting you know i'm not saying don't wear a mask but like the fact that they ass- uh, you know kind of assign a risk probability of covid is so much harsher and and this goes off campus too it's not mm-hmm. but anyway those are just some fun things that i've observed that the kind of disproportionate notion of risk as you point out like a plane crash you know claims a thousand you know mm-hmm. uh, uh, claims a, you know 20 lives that'll get make headlines but you know every day a thousand people dying car accidents right or you know yeah like we've we've gotten very fixated it's easy to get fixated on the risk that's in front of you and i think for a lot of people covid risk is what they obsess about to the detriment of thinking about risks we've actually lived with this whole time and in fact other risky behaviors that this might be encouraging in us um, you know, just because you're managing COVID risk well doesn't mean you're not managing other risks that well. Yeah, that's actually fascinating. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast by another author who's like a Navy SEAL, and he was talking about how we have this kind of, I translated it into like a coprocessor uh, in our brain. That Our brain is getting right now, you know, 13 million bits of information, and we're just focusing right now. We're focusing on the podcast. We're focusing on our conversation. Uh, but, you know, you only can store in your prefrontal concentration cortex coprocessor or about 3,000 bits of information every second, which is a lot, but actually much less than than an image or, or something like that. Um, so we think we're good at multitasking. We think we're good at risk analysis, but you're right. It's the thing that's right in front of you that actually can overwhelm. You know, the, the key to this, the guy said, is like, you know, if you get into a car accident, you, you're driving and listening to this pot. And I was, I was like, this guy watching me, like, are the Navy SEALs like everywhere I want to be? Uh, but the, the Navy SEAL guy was saying, you know, basically you, uh, you know, you're listening to this while you're driving because you've offloaded your conscious decisions about driving to you know experience to past history of driving but if you get into a car accident i guarantee you you're gonna have to rewind the previous 30 seconds of this conversation (laughs) you're not gonna be all multitasking crashing sharing information um but speaking of the military let's let's go there because uh you point out you know a good part of the book and one of the encomia on the book well deserved richly deserved is about the military and i was thinking and from uh, hr mcmaster who's uh who's a phenomenal 
uh, intellectual, as you point out, he's kind of like this, you know, business school professor mixed with, uh, you know, this warrior uh, kind of personality, very interesting uh, human being. Uh, but, uh, you know, it came to me as I'm reading your book that the fact that people don't apprise risk, but actually have an outsized impression of how good they are at, at apprising risk, uh, could be used for some sort of, you know, social arbitrage. And of course, I would never do that. But people do that in in poker all the time. They do that, you oh. know, that, that uh, you know, kind of people going on tilt. And you talk about Phil Helmuth and, and your studies of oh. him. Very fascinating example. But um, in warfare, it would seem like, you know, all is fair in love and war. We'll get to love later. Uh, but in, in war, or do you believe, do people take advantage of the fact that the enemy might not be as good at apprising risk, not only as they are, but as they think they are? Yeah, and I think uh, the story the HR told me, you know, you know, we usually think about things when, you know, tail events not going our way. I, I spoke to him about the Battle of, of 76 Easting. I, mm -hmm. I said it's been a while since I've done a book interview and how, you know, in that first Iraq war, that first war, like it went so much easier than we thought it would. <laughs> I mean, because the enemy just was weaker than they expected. Sometimes it's stronger. Sometimes it's weaker. But when we went back to Iraq, it turns out they were a lot stronger than we anticipated. And that that's his point is it's just that you can you can model things to death. But once you have people involved, things are always going to be um, uncertain. Because, as I said, you don't know how that person's risk modeling operates. You don't know what things are important to them. As I said, people can get fixated on one risk, the detriment of other risks. Um, they might care to fight for something stronger than you will. And all these things are always unpredictable. How can risk be taken advantage of, you know, aside from being venal and, and having all these negative aspects that I have, I started to think about academia and academic risk. And you go through in your book, you know, that one of your risks was to, you know, uh, was, was whether or not you go to graduate school or, or to, you know, and, and work with this eventual Nobel Prize winner, Robert Merton, who uh, gives another glowing endorsement. But what was that choice like? And I, I feel, I find academia is, is very interesting because there's a huge amount of risk uh, for for certain tracks in academia, and there's almost no risk in other forms. In other words, if I want to become a professor, it's almost as hard uh, being a professor of you know, astrophysics and cosmology as I am as you know making it into the NBA or something like that. Or let's just say it's professional major league baseball, which uh, mm -hmm. a lot of economists like baseball. So I, I'm going <laughs> to assume you do too. Uh, but uh, but but you know, but it's very easy. It's, it's extremely easy to become what's called a postdoc. Which I'm mm -hmm. not saying you know they're not good, but it, there's so much more of a market for, you know, people from on the, on the seller side or for, for people to become postdocs. So it would be as if it was incredibly Do postdocs generally get professorships. Well, so that, that's the point I'm trying to make. So it would be like, as if it was very easy to get into triple a baseball. Imagine if it was like, it was a piece of cake, you know, even Brian Keating can get into triple a baseball, anybody, mm -hmm. but then it's impossible to get into major league baseball, but it's actually very hard to get into triple a baseball. In other words, there's a gradient, you know, it's harder to get Get into ML to the major leagues than into AAA, but it's almost impossible to get into AAA. What I'm saying is in academia, it's it's as hard to get a position in academia as MLB, but it's the next stage below it is sort of as easy as as you know getting a high, getting on a high school team in a in a in a in a you know town that only has eight kids. Do most postdocs go on to academia, or do they do something else? Uh, no, I don't think it's 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 at least in my field. Many of them have gone on to academia, but uh, at least a third uh, have gone on to non-academic positions, or you know, non-academic but still research in a national laboratory, NASA, something like that. But cutting off the academic professoriate track. Yeah, and I imagine with the quantitative and programming skills, there's a lot they can do. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them go into finance, actually. They go into yeah. quantum. Jim Simons would only hire mathematicians, physicists, astronomers for a long time. Uh, he, he has told uh, many people in, in his biography, et cetera, that you know, he wanted only people that were good at that. And it turned out that even some of my friends who are professors of astronomy left their tenured faculty position, which is the most coveted thing you can get, perhaps mm -hmm. in all of society, to become hedge fund traders. So anyway, yeah, uh, it, it seems strange that there is this kind of risk inversion, you know, where 
you well, what was the process like for you when you had to make this decision you know of where, where you were going to go and, and what direction your career would take uh, was it was it grading on you and I'll ask you later advice to your former self but what would you say sort of to, to a younger version of Allison contemplating that very risky decision that you made well, in retrospect, I made an insane risk decision. <laughs> At the time, you know, like much like, uh, you know, um, your field, uh, economics, it's not really that big a risk. Going to, I mean, do I think doing a PhD in like French literature is a lot riskier. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like seven years in That's the job minor. market. That was my minor. Yeah. Yeah, but the job market is even worse. I mean, cause first of all, like, I, I believe anyone who has a PhD really has a lot of original critical thinking skills that should translate into a lot of jobs. But it's hard to convince people in the job market who haven't been through the process that that's true. Um, if you have a quantitative PhD, it, you know, people are more inclined to see you as skilled. Um, but, you know, there's even fewer jobs for French literature professors. That's right. So... I think if you're doing a quantitative PhD, it's really never that risky. I mean, you probably could do something that's shorter and easier and you'd make the same amount of money in the end um, and probably have a more certain career path. But I mean, if you, if you really have this intellectual need to do this degree, then, uh, you know, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a risky endeavor. And that was definitely true for me, probably for you too. Economics was something I really had this need to take all the way. Mm. You know, I, I, I always knew this was something I was going to pursue to that level. I think from the first economics class I took as a high school student, like I just knew I had to go all the way with this. Mm -hmm. So I had that intellectual drive. The problem was I kind of went into it without really a plan. Mm -hmm. Like, unlike um, your field in economics, you know, you, if you want to work as a professor on a tenure track job, you're probably going to find something somewhere. Economists are super rational, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of jobs outside of academia. So most people are like quite happy to go to government, to go into industry. So it's a pretty fluid market where people want to go into academia do, and those who don't do, and, and you know, no shame on that. Um, well, there's shame on that, but like if you do it, you don't you don't care. Um, but I kind of really got wrapped up with my research in grad school, but never really thought about being a professor until I became, went on the job market. And I was just like, every interview, I'm like, I desperately do not want to be here. And I cannot <laughs> imagine doing this with my life. I mean, it's wonderful. I said, I'm super lucky. As I said, a French literature PhD would have killed for that sort of opportunity. But I just realized it wasn't for me. Um, and so I, I did something really insane, which was I, 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 I managed to will myself to graduate without a job which was very unusual and considered a great shame in my department and brought great shame upon my committee, as I was told many times. <laughs> um, and I ended up like writing an economics blog for The Economist. And this was like 2006. So, I mean, this was really like kind of low level and kind of embarrassing. But I just kind of wanted to start something fresh. Mm -hmm. I don't know, a PhD is super hard. You, you know, it was, it was just, a, a, I mean, I enjoyed it intellectually, but personally, it's a very difficult process. So I just wanted to do something completely different. Um, so that's, I guess, was the start of my writing career, which ended up, as I said, anyway, going into journalism with a quantitative PhD is a questionable choice. It did teach me how to write, which is a very valuable skill, especially paired with a quantitative skill set. So in the end, it, it did work out. And they said I was only at The Economist for a couple months before I met Merton, and he took me under his wing and taught me finance. So that turned out to be a good thing, too. I think that's the thing you learn in this whole process is... If you have a good education, particularly if you have a quantitative PhD, you're never really going to be in trouble. Right. Um, you know, I, I think I wouldn't recommend a lot of people take the sort of risks I did, but having the sort of level of degree I had was a great insurance policy because you know you're always kind of kind of be employable and have the skills to give get you get to get you what you need. Yeah, my advice for you know people that want to go into academia is different from that those that want to pursue a PhD, and that's you know you should go into academia if and only if, and that's sort of the advice I'd give to someone writing a book, if you there's no other option. In other words, if there's if you don't do it, you will be forever miserable. And if there's no one else who can do what you're going to do in your book or in your research or even 
you have the passion that you have, if not the you know mathematical ability or whatsoever. So only do it. But the fallback is yes, as you say, not only will we pay you in graduate school to get your PhD, not not great, you know, it's it's minimum wage ish uh, currently. Uh, we can talk about minimum wage impacts some other time. Mm -hmm. uh, but because uh, I imagine you have uh, very many uh, strong opinions and facts about it. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, yeah, as you say, there's base. I have zero, thank God or whoever zero unemployment amongst the 17 plus students that I've had graduate with PhDs in my laboratory. So I'm very proud of that. It's probably my proudest accomplishment is that I always say to them, my job is to get you your next job. What you do after that, that's on you. In other words, I'll get you to the next point. I'll get you prepared, whatever you tell me. But you have to tell me every year we have a meeting. I say, are you still on track to do goal X from last year, goal Y and Z? And if it changes, that's totally cool. The facts change. I changed my mind as a famous economist once said, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I want to talk about... Uh, well, that's, uh, you sound like a good advisor. Well, I think the thing... Ask my students, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, what makes a PhD so terrible is also what makes it so valuable, is that you're in your 20s and someone says, come up with an original idea. Mm. And most original ideas are either wrong, derivative, or trivial. And I think having someone point out that your ideas are wrong, trivial, or... Um, or derivative actually hurts a lot, but is actually useful in life. Yeah. Yeah. I think the notion that, you know, everybody's above average, you know, <laughs> that goes to UCSD or some other place. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, you know, ultimately not as helpful uh, as you could. I want to get back to this topic. Let me just take a quick break to mention my guest today is none other than an incomparable writer whose work I love tremendously. Uh, and I think this is your first and only book so far, right, Allison? Yep. Allison Schrager is our guest today, author of An Economist Walks Into a Brothel and Other Unexpected Places to Understand Risk, which I do come away with a, f a fantastic understanding of in a way that I didn't really appreciate from disparate examples ranging from poker to getting to the airport uh, to, uh, to to skydive or to uh, big wave surfing and many other things. It just uh, tickles me and is a delightful book. Uh, has a 4.6 star rating, 216 rating on Amazon. Uh, and I want to get into Amazon. I want to get into kind of the marketplace of, of, of books and so forth. What, what did you learn about like the publishing industry, the economics thereof, and their risk management? You already mentioned a few things, which I agree with completely, that they mm -hmm. won't let you touch the cover. You think as an author, oh, I'm going to make this, you know, amazing cover. And they're like, no, we're not because they know that people judge books by their covers, which is what mm -hmm. I, you know, joke about at the beginning of the podcast. But what did you learn, if anything, about the unexpected risk management techniques of, of modern day publishing? Well, so I have a chapter about the movie industry and how, you know, most movies lose money, but you have these <laughs> unicorns. It's like VC investing that pay off for everyone. To some degree, that's the publishing industry. I think that describes fiction more than nonfiction. Non nonfiction has a less skewed distribution, but still somewhat skewed. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, I, you know, I'm working on my second book proposal now. And it's amazing to me that every, I'm sure you heard this too, is every, every time someone's, you're writing a book, someone's like, oh, I've always dreamed of writing a book. Yeah. And it seems so weird to me because, I mean, I love writing books. I'm so lucky that I get to do that. But it is really, I think, the way you have to approach it with a publisher, certainly in the nonfiction world. I don't understand how fiction works at all, so I can't comment on it. <laughs> is it like, I feel like I'm, I'm I, like I have a business idea and I have to convince a publisher to effectively invest in it. You know, it's, here's this idea I have, here's how I'm going to execute it, here's my marketing plan, here's how I can sell it, here's who it's going to, here's a product that people are actually going to buy. And with nonfiction, is it you just kind of write your proposal and you sell it that way, and it really feels less like a creative literary exercise and more like someone convincing someone to invest in your business idea. <laughs> yeah, so another risky thing that people take on uh, quite frank uh, quite frequently <clears throat> is uh, is a uh, enter into a very potentially high level of risk um, uh, contract in some sense, social contract, financial contract and that's called marriage and mm -hmm. In fact, you know, the only issue I take with uh, the book is is that you say that marrying young is a risk, which, you know, it can be a risk, but the question is, uh, are the risks offset by the rewards? I mean, everything that derives from marriage, including, you know, potentially children, 
um, mm-hmm. you know, is 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 fraught with risk, right? You never know. Like mm-hmm. children are like the box of chocolates in Forrest Gump. Mm-hmm. You know, you never know what you're gonna get. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's true, and you never know. People change, and if you marry younger, the probability for someone to change is. I always say people do change. You know, pe- the, the, the phrase is people don't change, but you mm-hmm. know, people do change for the worse. Uh, but uh, what do you say to someone like me? You know, who says that uh, there's great benefits also to getting married young and having children young because you have a greater amount of memory dividend to kind of draw from. I had Bill Perkins, author of Die With Zero, on the podcast uh, at the end of last year. And his whole point is that memories compound in that the Mm -hmm. same way financial interest compounds. The greatest invention of the human mind, according to this guy, Albert Einstein, uh, is the notion that uh, interest compounds kind of while you sleep. And his point is mm-hmm. memories compound too. So just like the hockey stick curve of exponential growth really turns up the heat towards the end, that behooves you to start early. So wh- um, what what is the basis of the claim that it's risky? Maybe maybe you don't think it's it's too risky, but is it? Why is it such a big risk to get married when you're young? Well, there's good risk and there's bad risk, and any risk you take has upside and downside, right? If you end up marrying the right person young, you have this life partner, and you get to grow with them, and you have children with them, and that's amazing, right? Like, I imagine there's few, I, I, I'm not married, so I imagine there's few things, you know, more, sad, in, like, wonderful than that. As I said, it, like having truly a life partner who you grow with. Of course, the the downside risk is you grow in different directions and you're unhappy. Um, so, as I said, it, it's a risk, but there are upsides and downsides. I think it, it's it's all good if you marry the right person. And I think there is an effective risk management tool in marriage, uh, which is used by about 50% of the, all the people who get married, and that's called divorce. You know, it's one thing if there was no possibility to get out. You know, we, we joke in academia that, you know, marriage is less risky than granting someone tenure because, mm-hmm. you know, if we grant someone tenure, we're with her or him for the rest of our lives. And actually, some of us see our work colleagues more often than we see mm-hmm. our home uh, family. So, yeah, the only thing I would say is, is that yeah that if you as you say with investment you know it's 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 not always clear that getting started young is the best track because you could expose yourself to great losses but usually people have less yeah. at stake and and when you get married young you don't have this huge portfolio that would get divided in half at least in the state of California yeah, so I'm working on my new book now, which is all about exploring why we're hesitant to take risks. Mm. And I've been delving into, I've been talking a lot to the anthropologist Helen Fisher about risk and relationships and people taking risks in relationships. And she's noticed that, I mean, I think my general book thesis is that people are becoming more and more risk averse. Mm-hmm. And she's like, she sees that a lot in relationships. She's like, she's the, um, she signed us at match.com and it said in an anthropologist who studies love that people are getting later prenups are a lot more common, Mm -hmm. that people really need to feel like they've known someone much longer, that in generally we are taking fewer risks in marriage and getting married very young is becoming less and less common. Mm. Yes, uh, that uh, does seem to be the case, and uh, and especially with children, you know, I've learned, uh, you know, having children uh, is, uh, as I said, fraught with risk. Obviously, there's physical, financial, etc. Uh, but you know, there's also one, one of my colleagues, a Russian fellow, who said something in a traditional Russian way, which is, you know, that you need. There's only one condition for me to have a kid, and that's you have to take the kid skiing. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck does that mean? And he was like, because to go skiing, you need to have enough financial mobility mobility you need to have enough free time leisure you need to be healthy enough you need to have a child you need to potentially get married to have a child and although obviously many people don't and that's fine uh, but yes they're they're you know kind of criterion on why people have children but never do so many people get into something that's so risky as marriage or you know and, and the commitment with as you know less attention paid to it than even their IRA or, you know, a vacation that they're going to (laughs) take. We have a bunch of friends that are happily getting married uh, in the near future. And, you know, it's like their plans change on on a whim. And uh, and, and it's not even clear that, you know, we need these huge weddings. And now that COVID is is showing, you know, kind of the links that people will go to to get married or avoid marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's it's permanently changed. And that was kind of leading me to your next, my next question for you is, 
if you wrote the book again, you know, knowing what's happened with COVID, would you change anything or would you amplify certain messages or would you point specific people such as the, the person who shall not be named who gave you this low star review uh, that didn't finish the book? Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> what are some of the you know, ways that you might reevaluate or amplify the claims that, and, the, and the arguments you make in the book? Um, well, I don't think I really would change that much. I mean, if I wrote it now, I wouldn't be able to travel and meet all those people. I guess that would be different. <laughs> um, but I think it, I think for me, it really sort of hammered home the message. I For the Greek version, I actually did write a new intro for it in honor yeah. of COVID. Um, I can't remember what I wrote, but because uh, it was like in June. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, time has lost all meaning. Um, but... I, you know, I think it's like these lessons are more powerful than ever. I mean, we live in a world where we crave so much certainty, but the world's never going to give us that. But we have tools to make us feel more comfortable, to make sense of things, to accept that the world is, is it like risk modeling to me, as I said, is trying to make sense of uncertainty. It's trying to put parameters around it. It's using the math that we're all so comfortable with to make us feel more comfortable. But ultimately, as I said, all these things happen you never anticipate. But I think if you're well-trained as a risk scientist, you anticipate that, you know how to adapt your models as things come up, and you understand, most importantly, how limited your models are. Yes. And it's really just a framework to make things. It's just a framework to make sense of things. Hmm. <clears throat> yes, it does seem like you know having a plan, as they say in chess, is better than no plan. Even a bad plan beats no plan. Uh, and then, of course, um, the philosopher of science, Mike Tyson, said, you know, everybody has a plan <laughs> until they get punched in the face, which seems you know provocatively risky, in my opinion. Um, what do you make about uh, since you are an uh, economist? Um, I want to ask you about things like Bitcoin and, and so forth mm-hmm. and Robinhood. Are these effective ways, in your opinion, to mitigate risk? What, well, actually, first, Bitcoin. What, what are your take on, what's your take on that? I had Michael Saylor on recently, and he's really extolling the virtues of it as kind of thermodynamically and scientifically sound money. Um, but as a risk against inflation, it seems like it's lost its purpose as a currency because you basically can't get a Bitcoin, you know, can't make change of a Bitcoin or some Satoshis. But uh, so it's lost that motivation. And even he doesn't extol that particular virtue, but instead as a his, uh, hedge against inflation. So what what is your opinion as a professional uh, economist? Well, um, I think for both that and, say, day trading on Robinhood, I mean, you're just taking adding risk to your portfolio. I mean, that's what you're doing with both of these. I mean, I don't see Bitcoin in any way as a risk hedge. I mean, I guess, like, part of the argument is, is if the U.S. government collapses, then, you know, you'll have your Bitcoin if dollars don't exist. But I feel like in that scenario, why would you have access to computers either? Hmm. That, you know, you know, it seems like the whole world falls apart. I'm not quite sure why Bitcoin would still be standing. I guess that's um, a catastrophic black swan risk. But just the ordinary risk, he says, the inflation, the real rate of inflation for those of us who want to buy houses, uh, you know, in a desirable city or want to buy, you know, a car or co- something collectible or even, you know, some things besides uh, oil. Uh, have been going up at about 10 to 15 percent in real inflation, you know, adjusted terms. I mean, are not adjusted terms in, in real terms. And so, his point is that you know that's a known known in Rumsfeld's. Yeah, language. but there's a, there's a ton of currency risk on Bitcoin, though. I mean, it's not a good hedge for anything. As I said, it just it's like it's like people who had who buy gold to hedge the dollar. It's like it's a lot more volatile than even owning the S and P 500. So, I mean, you're taking on something insanely risky to hedge a fairly small risk. Um, I, my, my, I've never, I don't own any Bitcoin. My closest experience with it when I was doing a story on the dark web was I spoke to a lot of uh, internet drug dealers on Reddit about their experience with Bitcoin and they hated using it because, you know, they when they make a transaction on the dark web, the money sits in escrow until the drugs arrive and the person uses it and they're like, all right, this is what I paid for. So in two weeks of your money sitting in escrow, the currency risk would completely wipe out their profits. So it, it's really like, it, it, it seems to me that Bitcoin has an incredibly high beta. So it's just like a way of amplifying market risk. So, um, you know, people want to, I mean, with, with risk, there is reward. And I think the same is true of day trading. Um, 
it, you know, the whole discussion around um, GameStop has made me realize just how much people have lost sight of what investing means, which is, you know, you buy an individual security really because of what it does to your risk portfolio. Ideally, you want something that's not correlated with your other assets, so it reduces risk. At the same time, you can earn more than holding cash. Maybe you decide you want to take more risk, so you add more risk to your portfolio. But everyone's talking about investing as if it's all about just picking these individual stocks that are winners which is hard and impossible. You can never do that consistently unless you're Jim Simons. And, you know, <laughs> there's not many of him. There's like him and Warren Buffett, and that's pretty much it. So odds are you're not one of them. <laughs> and, when, and you are going up against them, and they've got a lot more money than you do. And, you know, having deep pockets or access to a lot of capital certainly helps when you're investing. So it's bizarre to me that everyone's now fighting for the little guy to day trade. Like, this should not be the goal. You know, there's a lot of good ways to invest. And I, you know, people want to sort of play around with Bitcoin and, you know, day trade stocks. It's not something I would do, but like, I, I wish them well, but I think they should understand that they should only do that with money they're prepared to lose. Yeah, well, I mean, here's a sailor's, you know, a steel man of the Bitcoin position, which is that, you know, over any five year period of time, Bitcoin has gone up and uh, since its invention in t uh, 2010 has gone up uh, by effectively over 100% a year. Uh, even so that's, a very, that's a very, very short history. I mean, this is something that makes me crazy. So when I was at DFA and like really obsessing about how to model equity returns and bond returns, I was working a lot with Fama. And, you know, the thing is about you, you, they've learned the hard way because they've been around for a lot longer is the way you predict and model asset prices is to use as much data as possible. And 10 years tells you nothing. That's not even a cycle. No, right. But people say things, uh, you know, about, well, there were seashells that, that uh, Isaac Newton in, invested in. There was, you know, b baseball cards, you know, there are all sorts of things that don't have, uh, that don't have an actual return in terms of, you know, a long history of, of, of value for th and even things that do have a history, like large stones in Easter Island, uh, you know, mm -hmm. carried a lot of value for thousands of years. And, and, you know, gold is, of course, you know, the quintessential store of value. He points out that two or three percent, you know, because he's heard all, all the arguments that you're making. He points out, you know, every year people mine, you know, two percent of the stock of gold is added each year. And even Warren Buffett agrees with him. Warren Buffett doesn't think gold is a fantastic investment vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and even in terms of store of value. It fluctuates too. It's not a good currency. I mean, try going down to the to the you know bodega on your corner in Manhattan and scraping off some gold flake and getting a coffee. I guarantee you they won't accept it. You know, whereas Bitcoin, it has this kind of portability. It has uh, you know this 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 cryptographic mathematical foundation. It weighs nothing. You can take delivery of it instantaneously. Unlike gold, unlike seashells, and unlike you know famous works of art. And so, what's fascinating to me is that actually on the dark web, people are not using it for the reason that you mentioned, but also because the ledger is publicly available, and so people mm -hmm. feel like they don't conduct the same kind of illicit transaction. It's gone down from ten percent to one percent and then sailor will say to me and to you he'll say well how much illegal activity is the u.s dollar used for you know <laughs> it's just like yeah it's well no I, I only bring it up not because people use it illegally but just because it's a very hard currency to work with when something has so much value i mean you could argue the u.s dollar is not really truly fiat because it is backed by goods and services of the u.s economy so i mean yeah sometimes tulip bulbs or seashells get worth a lot but you never know when they're going to stop being worth something, right? So because they do have no intrinsic value. And that's the thing. 10 years of data tells you almost nothing. It doesn't tell you whether or not there's still going to be Bitcoin in 10 or 15 years. Maybe, maybe not. 100 years, 200 years, who knows? Right. So, I mean, and, and that's the thing about investing. It's not about picking the right stock that goes up for a week. It's about being able to consistently make money in markets over time. And it's a very, very few people are able to do that. Yeah. Because you have to know when to get out. And that's just... Very, very hard. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Allison, this has been so much fun. I wonder if we are now going to be willing to go into the impossible, where I ask you questions I ask all of my guests on the Into the Impossible podcast. These are things, kind of big picture, futuristic things, and past advice that you might give to your former self. So if it's okay with you, we'll switch into that mode uh, sure. and wrap up the podcast. Okay. Question. The first question is an easy question, and that is whether or not in, uh, in a 
a uh, hyperbolic calculus fashion if you can unite the form of gravity with the force field uh, of quantum mechanics. Is that, can we do that? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> all right. The first question is, uh, is what you would put in your ethical will. So you're a mentor and friend, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Merton, is it Thomas Merton or Robert? I, I just look. Robert. Robert Merton. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he won this medallion here that was endowed by Alfred Nobel, who knew a thing or two about risk. He invented dynamite, and he wanted it used for good things and bad things. Uh, but knowing that it was used for bad things, he hedged his legacy by endowing the Nobel Prize as sort of a, a, a way to rehabilitate the way the world perceived him after being falsely attributed his death. His brother's death was falsely attributed to his. And so he endowed a will that not only was meant to reward financially and with a gold golden chunk of metal, uh, but uh, the scientist who had made great discoveries in, in physics, chemistry, etc., later economics was added controversially, and the Nobel family does not like that, but anyway, that's a subject you know, I discuss in my book, but uh, not for now. Uh, nevertheless, the other uh, requirement is that the winners of the Nobel Prize must better mankind or humankind, as we say nowadays. Uh, so I want to ask you, and that's made it part of his ethical will, uh, what wisdom and so forth he wanted to bestow. I want to ask you, uh, when you reach the biblical age of 120 years old, what kind of uh, advice, what kind of wisdom, what kind of values do you most want to communicate to your ideological heirs? Oh, that's a heavy question. Um. I think it would be about seeking knowledge, as I said, and always being aware of what you don't know and being mm. curious and interested in other people. Oh, very good. Uh, the next question that I ask my listener, or my guest rather, uh, is uh, relates to a scene in the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. No. Yeah. Well, there's a notion that uh, there's a civilization that leaves this kind of opaque piece of technology called a monolith uh, for humanity to discover uh, when it's capable of decoding the message they're in. So it's sort of a time capsule meant to last for billions of years. I actually had on uh, Carl Sagan's widow, Ann Drurian, uh, who is a brilliant um, uh, writer, producer, not a scientist. And I asked her the same question I'm about to ask you, what would you put on a billion year long lasting time capsule? And she said, oh, I did that. And I said, Wow, that's pretty cool. She said, yeah, I recorded my brain waves and sent them into interstellar space on the Voyager 1 spacecraft, thanks to Carl Sagan. <laughs> so I'm not expecting that you have that same, uh, you know, kind of, uh, the, the, you know, access to technology like that. But I do want to ask you, in economics, in other aspects of life, what kind of sentence or item or, you know, belief system would you put on a time capsule for people, human beings, to discover millions or maybe even billions of years from now, should we last that long? Huh. Well, I guess that would be two books. Um, mm -hmm. It would be Peter Bernstein's book and maybe The Wealth of Nations. Because oh. I think, you know, markets really are an amazing thing. And we really can get around how useful they are. Mm -hmm. And we always want to try to do better. And we always think we can outsmart markets, but we never can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, the last question, instead of going forwards in time, you know, 100 years or a billion years, now we're going to go backwards in time and uh, and the, explore one of Arthur C. Clarke's famous laws. The first law is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I actually open every podcast with those very words said in Sir Arthur C. Clarke's actual voice. The second law you might appreciate is for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. And the third law is the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And that's the name of this podcast origin. I want to ask you uh, for advice to your former self. What aspect of life seemed impossible to a 20-year-old version of Allison uh, that you now became possible because of the courage you had to go into the impossible? So advice to your former self. I would have never in a million years thought I could get paid to do hard math problems or write. Two things I was never particularly good at. Wow. So life. I think. So I guess I would just say if you work really hard, like, I, I think I overestimated when I was 20 how much natural ability mattered. I would have thought you need to be extremely talented at both these things. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, but uh, no one will work harder. And that turned out to be important. Wow. 
Very, very nice. Okay, Allison, this has been a fascinating uh, conversation for me. I know my listenership around the world will appreciate this. I'll just sum up. Allison Schrager is an economist, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, contributing editor at City Journal, and a co-founder of Lifecycle Finance Partners, a risk advisory firm. And maybe I should have, you know, kind of uh, gotten uh, picture brains and gotten some free financial and risk analysis advice. Or maybe, do you work with scientists, Allison? Maybe I could be your first uh, scientific client. <laughs> Hey, whatever you're interested in, we can talk about it. <laughs> awesome, Allison. I want to thank you so much. I want to wish you to stay warm. I know there's a huge snowstorm out there on the East Coast. And uh, stay yeah. safe, of course. You have to stay risk-free. No, no, we can't be risk-free. <laughs> you taught me that. Have a wonderful mm -hmm. day, Allison. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.